Hi, I'm Patricia Rawlinson, and today we have a guest artist for Toll TV, and her name is Barb Franz Reb. And three years ago, Bunzi was added, right. or actually took over the other. But your artist's name before you got married was Franz Reb. Correct. And a lot of people know you that way. Right. Today, we're, she's going to paint um, and do a wonderful demonstration on this wonderful coaster box with the um, jingle bells. And go ahead and tell us what inspired you for this. Uh, the movie, The Polar Express. Oh, I had never read the book, but I saw the movie several it's years fantastic. ago and um, if you listen if you can still hear the bell ring it means you still believe and it just it. really touched me yeah I love the piece I'm so excited and there's different elements on each of the coasters so if you want to do you know or this is not the same art but if you wanted to do an ornament out of that shape you could right. easily do that these are some examples of Barb's other work um, she definitely has a colonial um, go ahead and tell us. You tell us about I'm your... passionate about Colonial Williamsburg, okay. so a lot of my designs are inspired by Colonial Williamsburg. This is the Palmer House down there, which has little put log holes in, in the house. Um, and at Christmas time, they put red and green apples in there for decoration. Oh, how cool. So that was the inspiration for this piece. And of course, I put the apples and other little pieces on it as well. Tell me about these little spoons. What are these things? The spoons are antique ice cream spoons. Oh, cool. Um, I had a, was, when I was doing craft shows, I had a demo while I was sitting there. And I needed to take something small. It didn't take up a whole lot of room and all, and I just started playing with these one day and started coming up with all the different designs and uh, ended up putting, I've got pin backs on them, or they could be made into ornaments as well. Um, so I've got several different designs on there. That's so great. And these are all of the, you've got how many designs on the website now? Maybe oh, 20 goodness. to 30. Quite or, a few. Yeah, there's probably 40 by the time you see the video. Um, the, what I love about your style is Number one, it's just elegant. Thank you. But it's also, I mean, you've got like the elegance of these ornaments up front, but then you've got the fun, whimsical Santa things. You've got the colonial. You've got this elegant coaster box. The spoons. I'm mad about the spoons. And um, on her artist site or page on our website, there is a video that you can watch that is just an interview. She's got um, painted ornaments for uh, Laura Bush. At, yeah, the first lady. Um, a thousand and how many? A thousand ten. A thousand and ten ornaments. She paints for Colonial Williamsburg in their gift um, line. Yeah. Right. And also, there's another. Um, tell me about it because I don't know the name of it. What's the Early magazine? American Life magazine. Okay. We had one here somewhere. Um, it does a uh, once a year. Uh, but we're gonna we tell you about this on the interview. Okay. So this okay. video right here, this will lead you into the project. We don't want to keep you. I know you want to paint. But then we'll go and flash over to just stop into her um, her artist page, and um, you can watch her interview, and it's really really interesting stuff. So Barb, tell me a little bit about our project that we're going to be painting today. Well, this is a set of coasters, a set of four coasters, and a coaster box. Um, I was inspired to design this when after I saw the movie The Polar Express. Oh, that's wonderful! If you haven't seen it. Um, Basically, the gist of it is, if you still believe, you will hear the bell ring. Okay, I like and it. And he got a silver bell, and um, so that was the inspiration for this piece. And I love Christmas. Yes. I love painting candy canes. Um, I don't generally paint on a black background. Okay. But for some reason, this, I just kept seeing black when I saw this. Yeah. I love um, it. And I, as I worked on it, I thought the colors worked really well together, and yes, so I was glad I, I, I stuck with the black. Now tell me about the coasters, what you did with these, because they're all just a little bit different. Well, each of the coasters, yes, is a little different, and I've seen other artists do designs and coaster sets, mm -hmm. and they've taken elements of the main design and put it on the each coaster, so that's what I try to do here. This one here is uh, just a little bit of the background technique, which we'll go over in a little bit, um, with just a little bit of holly and some squiggles and berries. This one here, I've added a little more holly and berries and the pine needles underneath okay. um, to give it a little more oomph, I guess. Uh, on this one, I added the candy canes. Love it. And this one here is just the bell, where I also have the ribbon um, and just 
focusing more on the bell, so everything else underneath is a little more muted, a little less, more subdued. So you could almost, if you were somebody that was a little overwhelmed by painting the same thing four or five times, you could do a little bit Absolutely. on each coaster and not have to repeat everything. Correct. Or if you decide you like the candy canes better than anything, Good idea. you can do that design on all or just do the candy cane, you know, again, what, yeah, whatever whatever floats your boat, I right. guess. Right, and then you brought some ornaments from your um, own students' ornament exchanges. Correct. And so those could easily, those coasters could easily just become... Ornaments. Ornaments. And right. so talk right. to me about your ornament um, party that you guys have. But probably 15 years ago, I was in a, um, a needle workshop. Okay. And she talked about, they did, she called it a round robin. And they were working on samplers. And... Each person in the class got that sampler, did their favorite stitching on it, and it was passed to the next person till it got back to the owner okay. of the, the fabric. And I thought, gosh, isn't that a great way to get a little piece of everybody mm -hmm. and the same? How could I do that with my painting students? And I came up with an ornament exchange. Okay. So every year at Christmas time, usually the first Saturday of December, it's my big blowout party. I love to decorate for Christmas, and so I do all my decorating. I do lots of cooking and baking, and everybody, uh, at the beginning of the fall, everybody gets the same shaped ornament. I like that they're all in the same shapes. That's yes. nice. So these are um, from several different years right, that right. these have been, been done. And um, many times they're very creative. This one actually has fabric on the back. Cool. Okay. Um, some are blank, and that's fine too. But these are some of the ornaments that I have received from my students over the years. Um, this is the very first one. It was in 1994. Cool. Um, done by Joyce, who was a lovely, lovely lady. Um, passed away from breast cancer. So mm -hmm. I really treasure this one. Yeah. That's yeah, so this is this is a fun event at my house. It's kind of my gift to my students. Love it for for their support and and their love through the year. Cool. Okay, the first thing I did was base coat everything. Well, seal my wood first of all, and then base coat everything in black, which I've already done. But I just wanted to kind of give you a little feel for it. I do um, when I'm just doing a flat base coat. Love using. Uh, a large filbert brush or an oval wash, different manufacturers call it a different thing. This one is really scruffy, but it doesn't make any difference when you're doing the base coating. One of the reasons I like it is if you're using a flat brush, sometimes it digs in to your surface and you, you get that little those little square marks. Chop marks, yeah. Right. Um, the rounded bristles don't do that for me, so I, I love using it. And I pretty much slip slap my background color on. Again, this is all done once that's totally dry. And, and I, I usually do like the whole set of coasters and the box, etc. And then I'll come back and do my second coat. I always give everything two coats. When that's thoroughly dry, then I do use um, something like Sil Super Film. That's really a great, great product um, just to get the grit down. And so I'll just sand that lightly just to get the, the grit down and then either wipe it off with my hand or a damp rag, something to, to collect all those all those paint crumbs and, and that kind of thing. Now, I'm noticing right off the bat that there's a piece of wax paper underneath your project and there's paint squirted out on the wax paper. What's going on? I took my first acrylic painting classes with Phyllis Tilford. Okay. Uh, awesome. I had seen her at a craft show at a mall in my area and thought she did the most gorgeous painting mm -hmm. I had ever seen I in my agree. life. Picked up her card, she gave classes, and um, so I started painting with her. And she used wax paper as the palette, and it, that's what I do. It's it's convenient. It's fairly inexpensive. Mm -hmm. I use one sheet forever. I turn it upside down and inside out and however I need to before I move on and throw it out for, for the next project. So okay. so that's why I use wax paper. And I also like to use it for, for blending as well. I think it gives a really good surface for blending. Okay. Um, 
I don't have my, uh, oops, background first. That's what I forgot to do. I forgot to put that paint out. Um, I, I, first of all, I don't generally use black as a background. I don't really like painting with black or white. I think they're too harsh, too mm -hmm. stark. The inspiration for this was the Polar Express um, with the silver bell. And I, since I love Christmas, wanted to incorporate all these other elements in it. And somehow black just jumped out at me like that was the color I should be using. And I don't know why. But it does seem to work with, with everything. Um, but I did want to give a little more interest to the background. So I just used a little bit of antique gold. And I'm using a dry, scruffy, flat brush. Uh, I'm using a, like a, about a size 14. I'm picking up just a little bit of paint and brushing it out on the palette so I don't have too much in my brush. Can we see how dry and scruffy this brush is? Let's get in closer and look at that brush. Oops. Yeah, it, all of the striations and stuff, how it's all separated. and That's right. what's going to help us in this background, isn't right, it? Right, exactly. Okay, good. Go okay. Ahead. Sorry. That's okay. So again, I, you know, I kind of work it so I've got paint through the brush, but I take a good amount of it out. And since I want this to be subtle, I don't want blobs of paint here. So I usually start someplace where I think my, my design is gonna, gonna go. So in case I do put down too much paint, the design is gonna cover it up. So I'm just gonna start, and that's probably a little more than I even want. And I'm just moving back and forth, kind of doing X shapes. And I'm just gonna use this I would have thought that gold would have stuck out like a sore thumb, but it's just sinking into that background right. nicely. And again, that's why when I load it, and I load both sides of the brush, and I'm just kind of working it out on the palette here. Again, my first strokes when I put it down sometimes are a little too harsh for me, and that's where my design area is going to be. And then as I work out, and I'm using very little pressure too, I'm not pressing down too hard. Um, the, the harder you push the brush down when you're using a dry brush, the more it sticks. So you want to mainly paint with just the, not really the tips of the bristles, but kind of the tips of the bristles. That's it's all I'm doing, not work pressing down all the way up to the ferrule. And again, I'm just using a back and forth, kind of an X motion, a slip slap motion there. And you can put on as much or as little as you want. I'm happy with that. Some people might want to add a little bit more. Love it. If they, if they like it a little bit more. Um, but I'm happy with that, so that's where I'm going to stop. Okay, the branches of the pine needles go on first. I am using my Zero Script Liner at wetting it down. And I'm sure everybody knows that when you're using your liner brush, doing any kind of line work, you need extra water in your paint and brush. I was always told to get it inky. Not many people know what ink looks like anymore. I kind of compare it to 1% milk. Yeah. Um, it's it's because 1% is not as creamy as regular milk. It's, it's a little watered down, but... So again, you need enough water and moisture in there, and I press my brush down as I'm loading it, so I get all the bristles loaded inside the brush, not just on the outside. I don't just tip the very tip of the, the brush. I'm really loading it, and pretty much up to the ferrule as well. And I like using the script liner because it does hold more mm -hmm. paint and water, so I can go a lot farther with one load. I don't have my pattern on this piece here, so I'm just going to pull a couple of branches just so you can kind of get the idea of where we're going here. And this color doesn't show up a whole lot on this background, but I just I needed something to give me <laughs> give me an idea of where I was going to be pulling those pine needles. So I've just got three branches there. That's that's going to suffice. I used avocado and um, golden straw for the branches, and I did use two different techniques to um, do these branches, or the pine needles, rather. On the original one that I did, I used my liner brush, so I'm going to show you what I did with that first, just so you can kind of see the difference in um, the way it looks, and then people can decide what, yeah. on their own how, which one they want. It's nice to have a couple want. of techniques. Right. 
So again, I'm using my liner brush and I'm loading it in the avocado, picking up again a little bit more water in the brush, making sure I've got the whole brush loaded. I, sometimes I think I play with my brush a little too much, but I, I like to make sure it's fully loaded. And then I start on the branch and I just start pulling some lines out. Now, I don't know why, but I usually, when I'm doing pine needles, start at the branch and pull down. And I think that might be a white pine. Okay. Um, if, you know, somebody wants to pull them up or, you know, do a different different way, that's certainly fine too, because pine needles grow all different kinds of ways. So that's on one side. And what I do too is uh, I start again on the branch and I kind of angle it down toward the bottom of that branch. Oh, good tip. It makes it look, I think, a little bit more natural. I do put a little curve on it, not too how much, but rather than just pull straight lines, it just thinks it, it softens the piece doing that. And then when I get to the bottom of the branch, just kind of some straight ones there. I may do one more here so I have another area to demo on. And I just keep reloading. My paint's starting to dry up a little bit, so I'm just tipping my bristles back into the water so I can re-moisten that palette. If it's a little warmer, of course, it's going to dry up a whole lot faster for you. And again, starting at that branch and just pulling down. I'm, I'm kind of filling in, and again, this color is not going to jump out against that background. This is kind of my shadow layer, if you want to call it that, my base layer. Just something so I have in here, since I'm working on such a dark background, if I went in with too light a color initially, it would just jump out at you. So I like to start out a little more subtle and then work my colors up from there. It's kind of a nice practice step for students as they're going too. If they're unsure of themselves, then they can put that color on that doesn't show, and then right. they'll be better at it once they get to the top exactly, layers. Exactly, exactly. Then the uh, when I was working these up to um, do this demo, I decided um, to use my uh, FM Black Gold Filbert Wave brush. Uh, I didn't know about these brushes when I designed this pattern, but I really do like them for. Um, doing the pine needles. Could you hand me that one? Yeah. This design actually was in the Decorative Painter, and I used this brush for, for these pine needles. It, it does give a much fuller look, but it goes so fast and Now, did you tell me something about this? Being asked to be, after it was in the Decorative Painter, it was asked to be in the yeah, private collection? Yeah, I was asked to donate the set of candlesticks to the private collection of That's SDP. So cool. So I'm very excited about that. This is the second set that I painted. Um, so the first set is in Wichita, and that's a private collection. So, and then later we'll share the story about how you painted the ornaments for the First Lady, and okay. we'll talk about that a little All bit right. later. You've sure. been quite honored in, I in your painting world. I've been very blessed. That's awesome. Very blessed. Okay, again, the Filbert Wave, uh, or I'm sorry, the Angle Wave is an angle brush, and it's it's kind of cut in waves, I guess. I don't know if you can... Yours is kind there of a go. little bit... And um, mine is a little bit scruffy. Worn. Yes, yeah. it is. Uh, I use this brush a lot. I love it for bushes. I love it for um, wreaths, Christmas wreaths, any kind of trees or anything. And again, for doing like the pine needles. Would that Actually, per yes. Per chance be Per chance, something? that would be this. Um, I loved doing it in particular. I don't know how well everybody can see this, but it's really great when you, you load the brush and you put it down, and I don't just bang Step it on. on yeah. I lay my brush down, but oops, I got some paint on there. Um, I lay the brush down as I'm, I'm creating my wreath so that I get the the look that I want. And this brush really holds, how, how do I want to say it? It holds its shape, but yet allows those bristles to, to spread out a little bit. So you almost get the feeling of individual pine needles on that wreath as I'm putting it in. And you wonderful. can maybe even see it better up here in the basket where, where it's against the dark background, um, where you can 
pretty much see that it almost looks like little individual and how much easier than trying to structure those absolutely and I, I do again you know start out with with a base color and add some highlighting and shading so you get the color variation in there but I really really like these brushes it's, for that yeah, it's a very and they, look. they come in um, quarter three-eighths and uh, half inch sizes so you know for whatever project you're working on you can use various sizes they also have a filbert wave that I like using for dry brushing, okay. um, streaking. That also does nice trees and things like awesome. that, too. It's a great, great brush. But it's better even, not that they're not great new, but I think they're better when you use them because you get all that gunky paint built up there in the ferrule and it helps to spread those bristles out even more. Love it. And that's especially good when you're doing trees or the wreaths. It, it doesn't really matter so much with like a pine needle technique, but when you're doing the um, trees and wreaths, I really think it looks, it works better when you're kind of spread out. But what I do is I wet this brush a lot and really, really thin that paint down. And you're just jabbing it. I'm just jabbing. You know, you're always told, take care of your brushes, not this one. This one, you really don't care. In fact, like I said, you kind of want it to be scruffy. And then I do just blot it on a damp part of my paper towel just to get the excess paint or yeah, paint and water out. Um, but you want to keep jamming it down because you want to spread out those bristles. So you want to try to get as fine a line as you possibly can. And then with this brush... I lay it again next to the branch that I put in, and oops, a little too much water still. Very little pressure. And one, two, three. Let me come back on that other side and fix that up a little bit. So in almost no time, I have my first layer of needles done. Wonderful. And you see how much quicker that went. And again, it does give a little, I don't know how much everybody can see that. It does, since the color is kind of fading into the background, but it does give a much fuller look than you get when you're working with just the, um, the liner. And again, everybody's preference. Right. I'm kind of an impatient person. So. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> so I, I, once I discovered th this brush and using it for this technique, this is my brush of choice Love it. anymore. Okay, my second layer of needles, I'm going to do the one with the liner brush now. I'm picking up my avocado again, and now I'm picking up some golden straw, and I'm just brush mixing those two. So I'm going to say maybe equal parts, but when I'm working on a design, I do a lot of just brush mixing, and I put it down on my piece and say, oh, it needs to be lighter, it needs to be darker, so I just pick up whatever color I need to Adjusting to adjust as you it. Go. Right. Yeah. And that's really such good advice. Students um, a lot of times get wrapped around whether it's 50-50 or not. Exactly. And if it looks too bright on your piece, it's too bright it's, on right. your piece. Right. And I always tell people, again, too, you know, that I'm telling you what I do, what I like, what I see. But if you like it a little brighter, I know one of my students used to paint everything really bright. Well, it turns out she had bad cataracts and didn't know it. Yeah. But she needed to see it, and so if I even told her one-to-one, -one, that was still maybe too dark for her. So she would pick up a little more of the yellow. Fine, it's your piece. You have to be yeah. happy with it. So again, I'm just brush mixing those colors, and one more time, I'm starting at the branch and I'm layering that on. Now, and you're not trying to hit exactly where you were before. Not at all. If I do, that's fine. If I go in between, that's fine too. And I'm not really trying to cover up everything I did before. Cuz you do want some of that base showing through. And as I'm brush mixing, maybe some of this color gets to be a little darker or lighter than the, the last mix I did. That's fine, too. If you think about nature, everything's a little bit different. Nothing is perfect in nature. We, when we're painting, I think we just want everything to be so perfect, and and it's not. No counting the, uh, the pine needles? No, nah, <laughs> never, never. And again, my paint, it's a little warm up here. 
so my paint's drying up really quickly so I just keep dipping my brush back into the water and pick up I'm not cleaning my brush in between maybe that's a bad thing but I just pick up a little bit extra moisture in my brush just so I can get through and again starting at that branch and just pulling down and I found too that if I sit here and do each line it, it's it looks too harsh I think for me at any rate if I use a quick motion it looks a lot softer and more mm -hmm. natural yeah. than if I'm being trying to be too precise and I think when you're precise I think your lines get shaky absolutely you don't have that flow absolutely. of movement now I still have my um, avocado paint in my filbert wave I picked up a tiny bit more water just so I have a little bit more play in here. I'm going to blot that on my paper towel again just to get that excess out. And so again, this is going to be my second layer on the one where I used this brush before. I think I keep calling it a filbert wave. It's a, an angle wave brush. And again, starting at the top or at the branch just stroking out and now I think you can really see that this gives a much fuller look to it but it goes so quickly yes absolutely uh, then the, the last thing I did was um, I just used the golden straw I'm going to use my liner brush now and I just highlighted the um, the top sides of the branches I, I usually my light source comes from the top and or right yeah that's really common. okay so I just wanted to highlight the tops of those branches so I just used uh, again the golden straw in my liner brush and if I pretend this is the top of my piece here I'm just going to add the golden straw needles on the top part of each of those branches and it just kind of helps it to glow a little bit it's a little bit brighter than the antique gold that we put on the background but I think it helps to pull that background color into the piece as well and again same thing with the angle wave brush probably have enough water in there picking up just a little bit of that golden straw in that brush and again I'm smashing it down to separate those bristles and adding that just to the top edge of those branches Ta -da! and there you go actually if you want you you know if you want it to be a little bit brighter when I was first working on this I thought oh maybe that's a little bit too bright but since the acrylic paint does dry darker then you see it wet if you want to brighten that up you can always pick up a little bit more paint on your brush and add a little more sparkle to the those branches okay we're going to work on the holly leaves first um, I put my stems in again I'm using avocado and again adding that extra water in there so that I can pull the paint easier I'm just, just going to kind of add them in as I need to. There are some down in here. I'm only going to demo these because it'll be a little bit easier for everybody it's a lot to of see it. Right, exactly, against the background. Um, when I'm base coating something really small like this, I love using a number two round brush or even a number three round brush. Again, I'm wetting the brush. Um, I didn't say this before, I just thought about it. I do like using bounty paper towels. Um, I see you use the shop towels. Uh -huh. Again, this is something that um, Phyllis stressed was bounty paper towels. I was with a, uh, or a friend of mine actually was painting on her own one day and her painting just wasn't working. She was really, really struggling. Her blending wasn't going well. She really struggled with everything. I realized she wasn't using Bounty. She was using a cheap brand. So she went out and got herself some Bounty, and she said she was amazed at how much better 
her painting was going. Your paper towels don't absorb. Absolutely. Your, your toast. Absolutely. Yeah. So I really do love the bounty. Um, again, the shop towels are really great too. And I even like these better though than Viva. When after I've used Viva for a while, they tend to get hard. At least that's my experience. The right. bounties stay nice and soft, and I fold them in quarters. I've got two here actually folded up in quarters, so I've got a nice cushion for my brushes. Right. So again, talking about taking care of your brushes, those cheaper paper towels have a lot of wood fibers in them mm. and can eat up the, the bristles and the brush. The bounty are nice and soft, so you don't really need to worry about that. So when I'm loading my brush to base coat, I, I do wet it, and then just blot it in my paper towel to get that excess water out. Since I'm work not working on a round item here, I'm working on the um, uh, holly leaves, I'm going to load that brush flat. So I'm pressing down from the side of the puddle. So I'm really making it a really flat brush. And again, when as it, you're pressing down, you're loading those bristles that are inside the brush as well as those that are on the outside. Yeah, and can I interject that? A brush, a round brush that's not cut right will not keep a flat. Correct. And that right. is, that's the sign of a good, good round brush right. is one that will actually keep a flat. If you don't have a round brush that will keep a flat, please order one. Right. <laughs> you need Absolutely. one. You Absolutely. You need it. Yeah. I, you know, and I always tell people when I'm, I'm teaching, whether it's at home or at a chapter or convention or something, you really need good brushes. I agree. Your painting is only going to look as good as the tools that you're using. Um, when I do beginner classes, I do require them to buy their first set of brushes from me. Yeah. I try to limit the number of brushes they're going to need for the beginner series because I, I know brushes are expensive, but I do require them to buy them from me because I know that I'm buying good brushes. Many times, and they'll go off to some discount store and pick up some cheap craft brushes yes. and then complain when their painting isn't looking right. Right, and you did say craft, right? Not craft. <laughs> yes, I did. Craft, C R A F T. Gotcha. Um, and and the, I have a s little supply of brushes at home. Yeah. They usually break down then and get a brush from me because they do eventually realize that. Um, a good brush is is worth everything, and a good brush is going to last you a whole lot longer too. Yeah, absolutely true. So, okay, so again, I'm loading it from the side of the puddle and loading it nice and flat, and I'm just going to use that to get in here. And I, when I was little and colored, I always outlined first, and I tend to do that with my painting as well. And the other th little tip, too, I know these are really tiny, so I hope people can see this. But um, I find it's always easier to pull into a corner, like the holly leaves have. You know, I can let me just do a bigger one over here. Holly leaves okay. have a couple different corners. So I'm going to start maybe here and pull into a corner. Pull into that final corner. And then I'll go up here and finish it and I'm pushing this one away from myself because these are the smallest tightest corners to get into and I turn my piece around I'm going to do the same thing on the opposite side so starting kind of flat into the corner and then again into this corner and I, I'm kind of thinking comma stroke I guess maybe is the best thing to say so I'm using pressure when I start and as I pull into that corner, I release the pressure. So I'm basically just painting on the tips of the bristles. And then the same thing, coming back into this corner. And then I color the whole thing in. Good tip. And of course, that, that's a big one I just demoed on. It's not part of the design, but I wanted everybody to see what I was doing. And I'll just finish this one up over here, because since these are so small, even though I am outlining it, it pretty much takes care of coloring in the whole thing almost right away. Okay, so I have a couple here that I've got all finished already. So we're going to start doing the highlight on those. And when I'm doing my highlighting or any kind of floated color, I'm doing any kind of blending. Alright, so I'm wetting my brush 
And again, I'm just, instead of blotting it way down like I might do when I'm doing base coating, I wet the brush, I gently lay it on my paper you towel. Yeah, you can see the water doing um, exactly what, you can see it really well. Do it one more time. Okay. And you can see it sucking dry. In well, this, this is if yeah. I'm really trying to get it out for base coating to exactly. get the excess out. But if I'm doing floated color, side loading and blending, I just gently lay it down on the paper towel to take the excess water out. Love it. My highlight on this, if I were working on something that were larger or I wanted to do a whole lot of um, layers of color, I probably would go in with something a little lighter. But on this one, um, and again, I wanted kind of the brightness too, I'm just going back in with my golden straw. So I'm going to, um, and this is a Phyllis Tilford little technique too, um, kind of... Uh, I don't even know how to say it. Perpendicular, I keep it here. Uh, maybe, I don't know, is that lever, lever and pulley or whatever. But I go into the puddle of paint, and I pick up paint on about a third of the bristles. And then I come over onto my palette, and I blend. And when I'm blending, I am really pressing down on my palette to get that paint blended through. And then I come back, and I blend the opposite side. And I do that right on the same path. Some people, when they're blending their paint, they're hopping and skipping all over the place. Well, by the time I'm done here, I have no paint left on my brush. I know I'm running out of a little moisture. Okay, so again, I'm going to pick up paint from the puddle in about a third of the bristles, and I always come back to the same path. So if I'm highlighting on my piece and I need to reload my brush, after I've reloaded it, I usually come back to that same path because I just keep picking up all that extra paint and moisture rather than leave it scattered all over the, the palette. And the other thing too is if my paint seems to be bleeding through my whole brush, I many times will just pinch that water side of the brush just to, to get it because it's that water that pulls it through the brush. So if you pinch that water side, it'll prevent it from going too far. And again, I did my highlights on my branches, on the, like the tops of the branches, so I'm going to do the same thing on my holly leaves. And again, I'm starting kind of in the, the little wider corner and pulling in to the tight corners. And you are laying your brush down just a little bit when you're doing I that. am keeping it pretty flat till I get into those corners. Right. If you paint with I'll do it on this large one again. If you paint with the corner of your brush, you're just getting a line, and that's not what you want. You want to keep the brush nice and flat so you get a nice gradation of color. So it's the brightest on the very ends. And I'm actually kind of helping it along. I, if I decide, ooh, that's a little too harsh, I'll blend it as I'm laying my highlight color on. Maybe walk it down a little bit. And kind of help smooth it out while the color's still wet. You know, once once the paint dries, you're pretty much done unless you want to rebase coat and start all over. As long as that paint is still wet, you can keep playing with it and pull that color in toward the center of the leaf, which is what you want to do. So I'll just add a little bit of highlight here to some of these leaves so you can get a little better picture of what this looks like. Okay, I'm running out of paint, so I think I'll stop with that one. And while that's drying, I also added some highlights to my stems. The only thing I did forget to do is add a few curly cues off those stems. So let me just pull one. Again, avocado, liner brush, lots of water. You can just, there's just one little curly cue. Okay, I'm going to pick up some of my golden straw again in my liner brush. And when I'm highlighting a stem, I usually do it in the center of a stem. So these don't have the leaves on them, but maybe like right in here. On these, 
I'm, I usually do it where there's a curve. So I'm going to add a little bit right here. Here's another curve here. On my curlicue, I can kind of play around with that a little bit too. So here's a little curve. Here's another little curve. Here's where it kind of went around in a circle a little bit. So I'm going to add a little extra highlight on there. It just helps to bring it out a little bit more. My shading on here is done with Plantation Pine. So I'll get a little bit of that out. Same thing again, wetting the brush, just getting that excess moisture out. Once again, paint on about a third of the bristles and blend, blend, blend. I always tell people there's no magic number to how many times you blend the paint on your brush. You do it until it looks right, kind of like you know, when, when somebody told you how to make bread, knead it till it feels right. Well, you just have to look at it. And it all comes with practice, too. I think the more you do something, the, the easier it gets for you, and it becomes almost mindless, if that's the right word. Yeah, you don't, I can you tell by the weight don't have of to my think brush about it. if I have enough water in it. Sure, sure. And, you know, I don't even have to put it on the palette. I can wait, oh, that's too much water. Right. But I've done this for so long. Right. You know, it just takes practice. Okay, so then we highlighted the top sides of the leaves. I'm going to shade the, the bottom side of the leaf again with the plantation pine and I'm doing the same thing, pulling into those tight corners. So let me do this big one here. I'm going to get a little bit more paint. And again, I'm really, on the bigger one, it's much easier to press my brush down a little more to get that nice full load than it is on the smaller leaves. But you still do, again, want to paint with the flat brush as much as you can. And when you're going into those corners is when you can kind of get up on the tips of the bristles. So you just get a nice, fine point into there. And one more I did. So then you can see, you know, and again, the shading kind of sets it into the background a little bit. So it's there, but especially on the um, coasters or even on the box lid, it's part of the design, but it's not screaming at you because uh -huh. I want my focal point to be my, my bells and my candy cane. And then I added, again, some shading to my stems and my curlicues. And my ladies accuse me of adding all this stuff, but I just think it, it's what makes a piece. Oh, it makes it deeper. This Absolutely. is the fun. I love this part. This is the fun part. Yeah. I really Base coating, I hate. <laughs> I hate doing leaves. I really hate doing leaves. And Well, I tell myself I hate doing leaves. But once I get the base coat on and I start playing with mm -hmm. highlights and shadows. That's the fun part. Absolutely. So, I, again, I'm using my liner and my plantation pine. And if this isn't showing up enough for you, if you want it to be even a little bit darker, you could add a tiny bit of black to the plantation pine just to make it a little darker and, and so you see that shadow a little bit more. But I'm going to add the shadows where the stems hide behind something else. So in this case, it's hiding behind the candy cane, uh, maybe where they attach to the, the holly leaf. And you can always pull a little vein into the holly leaf with this color as well. When I'm working on the curlicue, I highlighted kind of the outsides of a curve so I can add some shadow on the insides of those curves. And again, just to give it a little bit more interest and a little bit more depth. Once you get the leaves done, and there are a, quite a number of leaves if you're doing the entire set, there are a lot of these leaves, so you get tons and tons of practice on these. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start putting in my holly berries, or yeah, the holly berries. Um, as I said before, I really don't like using black or white, and in this case, I really think white would have been way too stark yeah, on think. this background. So my white areas are driftwood gray. Okay. 
red, which some of the berries are red. Red is generally a very transparent color. So you need to undercoat it with something. And you can use you can use some of the golds if you want, which do kind of show through and give you a little more, maybe an orange cast. I chose to just use the driftwood as my first base coat for all the berries. And again, I'm using my number two round. Whenever I'm base coating anything round, I like using a round brush. Again, I'm loading it from the side of the puddle and I'm pressing down as I'm doing that so I make sure I get all the bristles loaded, not just the ones on the tip. And I can't see my pattern here, but I'm just going to add a couple just so you can kind of see. Just a couple round circles. And again, you can probably see I'm outlining first and then filling in. And what I found that works for me, if my circle is kind of oblong or oval shaped, when I go back in to do my second base coat, I give it like a quarter turn. Uh. And so I'm starting on the sides this time instead of top to bottom. And that helps me round them out a little bit better. So my white berries are all base coated in driftwood. My red berries are undercoated in driftwood. And then I'm putting naphthol red on top of them. And again, the driftwood just acts kind of as a barrier. It's more opaque than the red. If you didn't use this color, it would take umpteen coats of red to cover, and even then it would just, you'd have a very, very dull red. I'm going to let that dry and I'll put a second coat on top of that too, because I, I want my red to be nice and bright. Absolutely. Okay, um, I add a little bit of highlight to each of the berries, and again, I try to focus on the side that was maybe closest to the top, and I usually do it on the right. On the white berries, Again, I'm using my number two round. I'm loading it in the driftwood, which is the base color, because I don't want too harsh of a, a highlight on it to begin with. I'm going to pick up a little bit of light buttermilk, kind of mix that together in my brush. And I'm just going to tap that lightly on the upper right, not right along the outside edge, kind of in a little bit for my highlight on those white berries. And then I'm just going to pick up a little extra light buttermilk in my brush and again kind of mix it in a little bit. And I know it's a tiny area, but I just tap a little bit more of just that little bit brighter color in the center of my first highlight. I'm going to do the same thing with the red berries, this time keeping red in my brush to begin and picking up that light buttermilk and again mixing that color into the brush and then I pat the brush back into its original shape so I've got that nice little point on the end of that brush again in the upper right of each of those berries and then I'm picking up a little extra light buttermilk again mixing that into the brush and this color is going to go on the very center of that highlight area. Okay, I'm going to add some shading to all these berries. I know they're tiny, but they need a little bit of shading to give them a little bit of shape. Um, my first shading on my white berries is going to be with neutral gray. Again, I'm picking up painting about a third of the brush really pressing down on both sides as I blend it through. And this is going to go kind of in a crescent shape diagonally opposite my highlight. And again, I know it's a tiny area, but you can get that in there. Keeping the brush pretty flat while I'm doing this. I usually don't clean my brush out in between loads, like when I'm doing side loaded color unless the color is really going through the whole brush. Just keep working with that moisture that's in there or if I start running out of moisture then I might 
pick up a little extra water in my brush. My second shadow on the white berries and my first shadow on the red berries is going to be done with graphite. So I'm cleaning that um, neutral gray out of my brush. I'm going to pick up a little bit of graphite on the corner. This paint is tacking up a little bit here. Trying to get in underneath that little film so I can get workable paint in there. There we go, that's better. So I've got my neutral gray on here. I, I didn't think, it added a little bit of shadow, but I wanted it to be a little bit deeper. So that's why I'm going in with the graphite. And that's just going to help to deepen that shadow. And as I said, I also used this color on the red berries to kind of set them in. Graphite, to me, at least, looks like it's got a lot of blue in it. And blue and red make purple. And I just thought it gave a really nice cast to those red berries. And my final shading, I'm going to switch coasters here, on all of the berries then, on the white and on the red, is done with soft black. Now this one really helps to set it back into that background. This is one of my very favorite colors. Um, it's it's black, but it's brown, and it's got a hint of purple mm -hmm. in it. I, love I that color. just love this color. So again, it's going to go on that shadow side, and you can see that it just really sets all those berries in. I didn't do the preliminary shading on these, so I'm not going to put that color on. Actually, maybe I will so you can see, you know, if you just go with that color, there's, and don't layer the colors up, it's just a whole, whole different look to it. That's why I like to build my shadow colors with, like, the lightest shade first, and so on, so that I get that really nice buildup of colors. I'm just going to add a little bit here to the red berries. Okay, we're going to start base coating in our um, candy canes and bell. I actually have the bell already done on here. And again, I mentioned before that instead of using white or a lighter color for these elements, um, I did choose to use driftwood gray. I wanted to give it a little more country, antique look, and I didn't want the candy canes jumping out on this darker background. And I did mention before that when I'm working on a round object, I like using either a round brush or a filbert brush, which is what I'm going to use now. And again, I'm loading it from the side of the puddle and really pressing down so I get paint in all the bristles. Um, doesn't matter what I'm starting with first. I'm going to start with this round piece of candy. And again, you can see that I'm outlining first. I guess I never really thought about it a whole lot until I'm showing you what I'm doing here and realizing that I'm doing all that outlining before I get everything else base coated in. But I'm going, helping, using those round edges of the filbert brush help me keep this shape as round as I possibly can. Okay, so that's getting base coated. I'm going to use this brush, too, to base coat in the candy canes. It's about the same width, more or less, as the area I'm working in. So if I load it and just press through, I can pretty much get this done without having to come back too whole many times. And again, I've got a nice rounded edge at the top of my candy cane, so those rounded bristles help to keep that area round. The thing, too, is um, people might tend to use maybe that number two round brush to do this base coating on here. You always want to use the largest brush you can to base coat the area you're working in. Even like a three-quarter inch brush, I know sometimes my ladies give me a hard time with if, if we're working on something large, but you wouldn't use that brush to paint your house 
or paint a room in your house, you'd use a brush appropriate to the area that you're working on, and that's what you need to do with your painting as well. And I would much rather use a brush that I can just stroke it in in one stroke rather than sit here and pity patting it in with a tiny little brush. Yeah, and you get a lot of ridges that way too. Absolutely. And you, you get quicker coverage. If you do just a few strokes, you're going to get better coverage on your piece as well. Mm -hmm. I'll give all of this a second. My first area is, is dry, and we need to have all those areas totally dry before we get our second coat on so we don't lift any paint up. Okay, I have my bill and my candy canes base coated in now, and I traced on my pattern. I like to use charcoal paper. It comes in blue and white. Here's the blue one. You can see I use it quite a bit. The thing I love about charcoal paper is it dissolves in water. Now, the thing I hate about charcoal paper is it dissolves in water. I'm with you. So if you are, are you can put your pattern on, you'll, you have to put your pattern on more than once if you're going to be using a wet brush over the area where you've traced your pattern on. That's the only drawback. I prefer to do that than have to deal with graphite lines. Yes. Uh, I just, and it, it just, even under paint, if you've painted over a graphite line and you still see the graphite under it, there's nothing you can do about it. But if you use the charcoal paper and you can still see the blue line underneath, it does come off with water, and I love that part of it. Um, so. I've got my lines on here for my candy cane. To do the stripes on here, I used Stroke Brushes by Low Cornell. Now mine are pretty well worn. You can see they're kind of well worn here. But once I wet them and get them loaded with paint, they do still hold their shape really nicely. I love these brushes for something like this where I'm trying to get as nice an even line as I possibly can. These are great. I do a lot of architectural things, drawing, uh, buildings. They are wonderful for putting in windows and doors. You load them, you stroke once or twice, and it gives you a really great, almost perfect stroke Yeah, every time. Like a really fat line uh, round brush kind of like a well a flat, they're not really thing. they're not really round they are yeah. actually probably better way to describe it are very long flat brush because yeah. it is a flat brush doesn't look like it right now because I said mine are pretty worn yeah, it looks like a handy but brush it's it's great and they're great for lettering um low cornell calls it a stroke brush um, there's another brand out there i can't remember who right now calls it a lettering brush yeah. but these are wonderful wonderful brushes so to do my stripes, again, I'm loading the brush in water, taking the excess out, loading into my Naphthol Red, and again, both sides of the brush, pressing down to load all those bristles. And I'm doing, when I'm doing candy canes, I do like an S-stroke, because I think it makes it look like it's going around more so than if I just pulled it straight. So to do my S-stroke, I'm going to start at the tips of the bristles, pull through, press, and again end up on the tips of the bristles. And you can see how that brush really held the shape there. When I'm going around the corner here where the candy cane kind of curves, I have to play around with it a little bit because it does get a little bit narrower down here, but you can still get a really, really nice, nice look with that brush. And then there's one more down in here. I'm going to work around that round piece of candy to get that in. When I, I do all my stripes going one direction first, when I come back in to do my second coat, I always turn my piece around and I come back the opposite direction to get better coverage. And it gets gives a little better um, look to my S-stroke. You usually end an S stroke better than you start it, at least I do. So if I'm starting where I ended and pulling through, again, I'm getting better coverage and I'm finishing off that stroke so it looks more like it's curving all the way around. So I'll get all my stripes in on, on here with that naphthol red and then I'm going to switch to a dry brush. Um, 
there are a variety that I have used over the years. This is a black gold. It's called a Dynasty brush. This is a number six. Low Cornell makes um, dome brushes. Um, Lang Nickel. It's um, 5005 round brush. Mm -hmm. They're all pretty much the same. They're round brushes. They have um, pretty soft bristles on them. I love these for dry brushing. I'm going to add a little bit of highlight to all my red stripes on all my candy pieces. So I'm just going to pick up dry brush again into my Tangelo Orange. Take that excess out on the palette. And I'm going to decide where where's my highlight going to be. Again, I'm going to put it at the top and I'm just coming all the way around on that same side to do my highlight. I, I'm not putting it right along the outside edge, but I'm coming in a little bit from that edge and just dry brushing some of this tangelo on my red stripes. You can see I've done it here on the round area too. And once I get that tangelo in there, I'm going to take my liner with my driftwood and I pulled just a, a circle all the way around on the white or the round piece of candy and I'm going to pull a line through the orange area on my candy canes. Now obviously it's not going to show up on my driftwood based area but that's okay. You still get the illusion that it's there. And I'll add one on here as well. So that's kind of the first couple steps on the candy cane. I'm going to go back to, to the bell. I'm going to switch coasters here. And I'm going back to my dry brush. Now I did use this brush to do the orange. I've washed it out. I've taken out as much water as I can. And then I just rub it on my hand to get all that extra water out. The friction and the warmth of my hand helps to dry that brush out a little bit. I'm going to start my highlight on my bell with the light buttermilk. And again, I'm picking it up with my dry brush. Actually, I'm going to pick up a little bit of driftwood in there as well. Because I don't want it to be too harsh. Taking the excess out. Again, my highlight is coming kind of from the upper right, so I'm going to highlight the upper right part of my bell, and I'm kind of tapping it in like in a circle. The bell is round, so you want to keep that round shape. I've got it in the upper right, and then I'm going to come down here in the lower left as well. And I'm going to pick up a tiny little bit more light buttermilk in my brush, take the excess out, and tap that in the very center. I always tell people, um, as you're building your highlights, you do your first color, and then when you put your second or third or whatever, you want like a halo of the, the color underneath showing around that next color so that you see that gradual build up to that. If you want it a little brighter, you can pick up a little bit more buttermilk. Again, take out the ex excess and tap that into the center too. I also highlighted the little ridge that comes around the bell. For that I used my little trusty little two round again. Again, I'm loading it first in the driftwood and picking up some of the light buttermilk, mixing that in my brush. That's coming over here on the right side. And then I also put this above the highlight that I put on the bottom of the bell. And once again, you're going to pick up a little more extra light buttermilk to add a little more highlight. And again, this one is not quite as wide or as long. And on the round part here, it goes kind of in the center of that area. And I'll pick up just a tiny bit more just to brighten up those edges a tiny little bit. Okay, we're going to start shading the bell. I did three layers of color on the bell. Uh, so again, side loading and blending my brush. I added shading above 
and below this little ridge that comes along the center part of the bell to get that set in. And then I'm going to add shading opposite of my highlights. So on the top part of the bell, my highlight was in the upper right. So I'm going to shade that left side. I know my paint is still wet here by the ridge, so I'm just going to kind of play with it. And I'm pulling that color in toward the center of the bell as well. You don't ever want to have just angles when you're doing um, your shading. Let me just play on here a little bit. I hope you'll be able to see it on here. So if my angle goes this way and this way, it just looks like a, a silly little corner. If I've got, got an area where I've got a corner there, I do the two sides and then I'm pulling that color up toward the center of the object. Let's say this was a square or maybe it was even a, an, a round area where there was a little corner area coming in. I'm walking that color in. It gives it a much nicer and softer look if I do it that way. Okay, so I had got my first shading done on that bell. I'm going to add a little deeper shading now with graphite, which I actually have on this sample piece. So I did exactly the same thing. Came above and below that rim. Um, added it on the sides um, opposite where my highlight is. Except on this one, I see I forgot to add this little back-to-back -back here. And I didn't ha don't have the neutral gray in there, but we'll pretend that I did that one. So that's going to go right in here between these two highlight areas. So this time I'm using the graphite. And I'm also starting my first shadow on my candy canes is done with the graphite. So it's again going to go opposite the highlight side. So on this part of the candy cane it comes on that really tight curved area. Um, on this one here again across from the highlight. I shaded on both of those candy canes next to the round piece of candy and I shaded around the outside edge of that candy with the graphite as well. My final highlight on these is done with the soft black. So again, side load and blend. On my bell, I just added this in the darkest areas. So basically for me, that's on this shadow end of the rim part right here. And again, that's not walked over as far as the first two colors. I'm pulling it in just on that upper left area and kind of moving the color slightly over right above that rim and then on the lower area just right in here again kind of in those V areas and just pulling that color a little bit toward the center part of the the bell. I did want to say too on the coaster I have the full bell where on here I, just, I have part of the bell tucked underneath that candy. So you do need to get some highlighting and shading in the directions um, on my pattern packet I talk about this. The highlight goes on the part of the bell where the ribbon goes through. That's on the um, center part and then you need to do your shading where it connects to to the bell. So just wanted to point that out too. I, I'm adding a little bit of the soft black shading also on my candy canes. You don't need it too whole dark. You do need to make sure though you get it a little darker in through here where the round piece of candy lays on top of those other two. My, uh, I'm just going to do a little bit of that. I think everybody pretty much can figure out how to do that. But again, I have a V area here, a corner, so I'm pulling that color out so it's not just in that corner, kind of works its way into that piece of candy. To do the, uh, and I, I don't know what you call it, there are always little holes on the bottom of, of the jingle bell. I'm just using my liner brush and some graphite. 
and I start pretty much in the center part of the bell and just pull up a couple of thin lines. And then you can paint the actual little holes with the graphite as well and my little round round brush. Oops, it's wrong color. So again, just two little circles. I do have something I'm going to do to that, but while that's drying, I'm going to give you a couple other little finishing things that I did. After the whole design is done, and I'm happy with it, those circles are maybe a little large, but at least I'll be able to demo what I need to on there. Um, I used soft black, and again, side load and blend. And anywhere something is laying underneath another object. So for example, my pine branches here are underneath the um, candy cane. I'm going to add some shadow right where the candy cane sits on top of the branch. That's a good sinking look. Right, it just really helps to pull the whole thing down into the background and pop those light, light areas out as well. I've got some holly leaves sitting on top of these branches and they kind of fade into those branches. So now I'm going to use my soft black, blend that a little better, my soft black around those. And now you can see those holly leaves sticking out a little bit more. You can do the same thing next to your berries if you need to. Again, here is a holly leaf sitting on top of that branch and that's just going to help set all of those areas in, especially like next to the bell and through here. Again, more holly leaves up here. I'm just kind of skipping around just to give you the idea. Um, I'll show you the final one when, when we're finally done with all of this. So again, that soft black just really helps to set everything into the design. Um, red is my favorite color. So I then took my dry brush, and let me grab a little bit more red. I like to add different tints of color throughout the piece, just to help pull the whole thing together. So I'm picking up that red with my dry brush, taking the excess out. I added just lightly, oops, even that's too much, just light hints of red on my bill. And you can put those wherever you want. You just don't want to overdo it. Just a little a little bit of this goes a long way. It's like perfume. Right. <laughs> right. And then you can either side load and blend or use the dry brush. I like to add some hints of red on my green areas. So just kind of here and there. You can add some of this also. Um, I definitely did do a side load and blend with the red and added this a little bit of shading to a few of my holly leaves. Again, just to kind of help pull that whole design together. So you might want to do, I've got a bigger cluster here, I might do maybe two or three up in this cluster. Here's a smaller cluster, so maybe just one or two. You don't want this to be every single one. You just want to kind of emphasize a few of those. The other thing I did was take go back to my avocado, which was my leaf color. And again, a side load and blend. And I added this color to the, the side of the candy canes and the bell that are furthest from my light source. So my upper right is my light source, so basically my lower left is where I added just a light shade of that green. You can, I hope a you can see light. a little reflective light, right. And it just kind of helps perk that up a little bit. I'm going to do the same thing here on my candy cane. And it just, again, kind of helps pull those red areas into the green part of the piece. 
um, the last thing I did on the bell then, I put in those little holes at the bottom here um, with the graphite. Uh, I need just a little bit of neutral gray. And again, a side load and blend. And I did this just because it looked too flat for me if I didn't do anything. And I just did a little C stroke inside each of those, not right along the outside edge of the circle, but kind of in a little bit. Just a little bit of a highlight in there so they just weren't too whole flat. Um, again, more shading in here. Let me get the finished one over. So I've got a lot of shading going on here with my soft black, again, to set all those areas in. Um, you can even add your um, red with your liner brush if you like. A little bit on those holly leaves. Uh, again, here's my green on the uh, candy and on the bell. And um, if you like, you can even add, scrub in a little bit of green on the bell and maybe even a little bit into the candy cane if that's something you would like to do. Can you just flip the edge of that box just sure. a little bit so that they can see? It's so pretty having that Hollywood, it's a nice detail. And what, mm -hmm. I, what I usually do is I actually I didn't even use a pattern. I just painted in the holly leaves yeah. and kind of scattered them around the area. Then I pulled in my veins. And, and my stems. I find that easier to do because I can place the leaves where I think I need them to be and then attach them with my stems. Um, again, did the curlicues and did this exactly the same as I did on, on the other parts. Same thing with the berries. Everything's just kind of done the same and kind of repeated all the way around. Um, you can add a little bit of red highlights or, or tints to, to this area as now, well. Talk to me about how you finish your piece. What, what kind of varnish are you using? I'm noticing on, like on the plate and on this one, both of these have beautiful finishes. Actually, uh, oh gosh, I wish I had remembered to, to write it down. It's um, a varnish I get at the Woodcraft store. Okay. It's by General Finishes. It's just a satin varnish. Um, it's made for wood furniture and children's toys. Okay, so it's but you, durable. you can get us that name. Yes, I can get okay. the name, yeah, absolutely. Right. It's um, very durable and it's non-toxic since you can use it for kids' toys. Um, I have never, a lot of the other varnishes I have had issues with, bubbles and that kind of thing. This levels beautifully. I put it on, I don't glop it on, but I put it on fairly thick. So it's not, it's maybe a, a little more than a sheen. We've got a little sample of something else here. So I might, you know, just put it on. Let's see here. Let me just grab a brush. Trying. Since, since varnish is self-leveling, I don't know how well you can see that. This is kind of tacking up too, but I do put it on relatively thick. Varnish is generally self-leveling, and so once it, it's as it's drying, it's going to level okay. itself out. I usually do three coats. Um, on something round like this, it's not so much of an issue, but if I'm working on a square area, if I brush um, horizontally the first time, my second coat, I always go vertically okay. just to get better coverage, and then the third coat, whatever. I use three. I don't know why. It just to me, it, it seems like that's that's the right thing to do. Um, this, and again, this, I really do like this varnish. Uh, Deco Art makes a good varnish too. This stuff, though, I can buy in a quart. Yeah. And it lasts me a good long time. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm.